Today's video is brought to you by Brilliant.org. Because, well, I'm not so brilliant. Like a lot of folks, I didn't retain a thing from high school. Math was a chore, but I can't help but wonder if I'd have a real job if I took it more seriously. Luckily, it's not too late, thanks to Brilliant. They say math is just another way of seeing things, and Brilliant is like a new pair of lenses. They've got thousands of fun, interactive lessons to help you build a strong foundation while moving into advanced concepts. It's an essential tool for professionals to learn new skills, and best of all, it's built for busy people. So you can boost your brain without also busting your balls. That's brilliant. Visit Brilliant.org slash Craft Computing to try everything they have to offer for free for a full 30 days. And the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Again, that's Brilliant.org slash Craft Computing. And thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So how much bandwidth is overkill for a home lab? That's the question that we are most definitely going to answer today, most likely in the form of a 100 gigabit switch, but not just one, two of them. That's right, we are going full 100 gig in my server rack and here in my office. The folks over at Mikrotik were kind enough to send over a pair of their CRS504 4XQIN switches. These are four port QSFP28 100 gig switches, and they draw just 45 watts of power from the wall under full load. So if you're looking for a quiet, fast, efficient, and uh, I'll just say fast again switch, this is probably going to be tops on your list. And the really cool part is these come in at only $799. Now I say only in the context that when you're talking about 100 gig switching, that is a relative bargain. One of the first things you'll notice about this switch besides the four 100 gigabit QSFP28 ports are the number of power input options, which this one has in spades. The most obvious one is the pair of 90 watt power supplies that are hot swappable and fully redundant on this unit. There's also a two pin input for a 36 to 57 volt. There's also a barrel jack right next to that, but this switch can also run on PoE plus inputs via the management port. So no matter where you wanna deploy this and no matter what your power options are there, either AC or DC, you will be able to fire this switch up. As far as connectivity options go, you have four QSFP28 ports, which will all run at a full 100 gigabit per second. You can also break these ports down into four 25 gigabit ports, or even further down than that if you need 10 gig or one gig connectivity options. We've also got a serial console port for dialing into this switch from a non-network connected device, as well as a management port, which supports PoE in, as well as 10 and 100 megabit connections. Other accessories inside the box are pretty basic. We've got a quick start guide, our network rack ears, and a pair of AC power cables. We will be mounting one of these switches inside my server rack, and the other one we're actually going to be mounting up underneath my desk using these same rack ears, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. Now, as far as converting my home network from 10 gig to 100 gig, obviously I do need to replace some of my infrastructure. The main one being the fiber line that runs from here in my office out to my server rack. I wasn't overly forwardly thinking when I installed it and installed a multi-mode fiber, which is only capable of 10 gigabit at this distance. So we will have to run alongside that a brand new single mode fiber cable. This one's an outdoor rated and shielded cable, so it should hold up just fine on the side of the house. And what optics are we going to use? Well, I actually purchased all of these myself, but you will never, in a million years believe the price that I paid for them. I got 16 Intel single mode fiber 100 gig LC optics for $5 each. I paid $120 for all of those. In fact, the optics were so cheap that I'm running single mode fiber to pretty much all of my connected devices. That is my servers, as well as my couple of workstations here in the office. However, there is the elephant in the room of how do I connect my 100 gig switch to my existing switch infrastructure so my devices can actually talk to everything else in my network as well as reaching my router. For that, I am going to use a DAC cable. This is a QSFP 100 gig DAC that breaks out into 
four SFP28 ports, which will support 25, 10, and one gigabit connections. So attaching this to my existing Microtech switch, which supports 10 gig, should be as simple as literally just plugging in both ends. So what's the first step in all of this? Well, rather than running my network cable and then hoping everything works on both ends, I think I'm actually going to unbox both switches right here, connect my optics and my single mode fiber between them and make sure I get lights. So that's gonna be step one before I waste a lot of time and energy in putting something together that's not going to work. So let's get the second switch out of the box and let's light this thing up like a Christmas tree. While I'm getting this set up, uh, let's go over a little bit more about the hardware. So as the name implies with the CRS504, this is a cloud router switch. Now, unlike some of the others in their CRS lineup, these will only run router OS this time as switch OS has not been fully implemented and ported over to this hardware. So you can still do full layer two connections and that's how I plan on running mine but you will have to run the full fat router OS rather than the slightly lighter weight switch OS. Let's see if this works. Yes! Yes! That right there is an activity light, which means not only is the GBIC connected but, and detected by the CRS504, but we have a connection to the other switch. And this other light right next to it means that we auto-negotiated at full duplex 100 gig. Let's, uh, let's go install this in my rack, shall we? Now there is one more thing to address before we get these switches fully installed, and that is how do I plan on actually running 100 gig between all of my systems? And that is gonna come down to these cards right here. These are, Mellanox ConnectX 4 cards, I believe, and they are PCI Express X8 cards that also happen to have a QSFP28 port installed in them as such. So these should be fully compatible with pretty much most Linux distributions and TrueNAS, FreeNAS, etc as well as have full windows drivers so when we're all said and done i will have 100 gig on my streaming station on my editing machine and at least two of my servers although probably more now that i know this whole thing works because i've got four network cards i've got 16 gbix i've got probably a quarter miles worth of fiber let's get this thing rolling
Welcome back to... Oh, wait, we've been here already. Cool. Uh, welcome to the second half of the 100 gig networking video. As you can tell, a lot has changed. Uh, I killed Mirror Universe Jeff. Uh, we're now drinking cocktails instead of beer. And uh, it's about six weeks since I started filming. Let's go over what's happened in the meantime. As I started on this project around six weeks ago, you'll have to forgive me if I do repeat some of this from the first half of this video, but I want to make sure that all the information gets in here. Starting off, who would have thought the easiest part of this would be installing the Mikrotik CRS504 switches? Well, if you've ever put something in a rack, yes. Uh, these are running Mikrotik's router OS, and unfortunately, Switch OS is not an option when it comes to these. So you need to be a little bit more familiar with some of Mikrotik's products, as well as some layer three networking concepts if you really want to get the most out of these switches. Configuring these was an absolute breeze, as they offer both a Windows client as well as a web-based GUI to access from a web browser. All the menu options and different configurations are laid out very plainly and are easy to find. So thumbs up for that. Like I demoed in the first half of the video, the Intel optics that I purchased worked perfectly with the Mikrotek CRS504 and auto-negotiated a 100 gig link with pretty much no hands-on from me. That definitely would not have been the case with the optics had I gone with a mainstream Brocade, Arista, or Cisco switch for a backend. Now, of course, as forward-thinking as I tend to be for a lot of my projects, I did end up running fiber from my server rack out to my office here. Unfortunately, I only ran OM3 because I really didn't foresee a circumstance where I would need more than 10 gigabit. So I had to run a new line using single mode fiber. Now before the comments start, yes, multi-mode, especially at the 20 to 30 meter length that I have around here, is capable of 40 or even sometimes 100 gigabit connections. However, there's not a lot of optics and GBICs that you can buy that will run multi-mode at those speeds. And well, when it comes down to spending one to $2,000 for a single optic to run multi-mode at 40 or 100 gig versus paying $7 per optic and then running 30 meters of new single mode fiber, you can guess where my money went. I decided to run these lines in parallel rather than replacing the multi-mode fiber with the new single mode, as I still have a CSS326 switch from Mikrotek in here, which handles all of my one gig RJ45 connection. As the CRS504 doesn't have any one gig RJ45 ports, that's still gonna be a necessity here, and I didn't want to just use one of the 100 gig QSFP28 ports to downsample into either 10 or one gig connections. Also, rather than rack mounting switches here in my office, I use a tried and true old trick of mine of flipping the rack ears 90 degrees and just wood screwing them into the bottom of the desk. Now, long term, I will probably invest in a little for you shelf that'll sit underneath my desk. But for right now, this works just fine and has served me very well for a number of years. With the new fiber ran and the keystone plates uh, <coughs> properly installed this time around, it was simply a matter of connecting the optics, connecting the fiber, and watching that glorious LED that indicated 100 gig connections spring to life. So I've got a 100 gig backbone now, but that really does me no good if all of my clients and servers are still running at 10 or even one gig per second. So it was time to start installing my PCI Express Mellanox Connect X4 cards. Now, there are two main reasons I decided to go with the Mellanox Connect X4. Number one, they're some of the cheapest QSFP28 PCI Express cards on the market, as you can pick them up used for only about $110 to $125. Secondly, they work natively with driver and kernel support in Linux, Windows, and even BSD. So out of the box, these will run in TrueNAS with no extra configuration required. Now by default, these cards are set up for InfiniBand networking, which is not compatible with Ethernet switches. So the first order of business is to tell it to switch in the firmware of the card from InfiniBand to Ethernet networking. These commands are a little bit different depending on if you have Windows, Linux, or BSD, so make sure to check the documentation for that, but I will leave the command that I use down in the video description, just in case you can't find the proper documentation, because that took me a little while. I'm happy to say that the first three systems I installed these cards into worked without a hitch. 
First up, we have my Proxmox server running in my Craftinator sent over by 45 drives. Again, huge shout out to them for that. However, I have significantly upgraded that system from stock as it's now running an Intel Cascade Lake 5218 Xeon 16 core processor, as well as well over a terabyte of memory. Next up, we have my Proxmox virtualization box, which is actually going to be decommissioned before too long with a couple of these Earying 11900H boards. It's currently configured with an AMD Epic 7601 32 core processor with only a 2.5 gigahertz max turbo. So not exactly setting the world on fire with single threaded performance. More on that in just a minute. Up next is my streaming PC running an Intel i7-7820X on an X299 Creation motherboard from MSI. Now, unfortunately, this particular CPU only has 28 PCI Express lanes natively on it, and so even though I do have an X299 Creation board, that second PCI Express slot is running at X8 speeds. So this is not going to be able to hit quite 100 gig. However, it should still be capable of around 64 gigabit of raw PCI Express performance. Last but not least was supposed to be my main editing rig, Plaid, which is running an Intel 13900K, an RTX 3090, and 64 gigs of DDR4-3600. However, the MSI Tomahawk motherboard that it's running on only has a second PCI Express slot greater than X1, and it happens to be an X4. And for whatever reason, that motherboard and this PCI Express card did not get along. I don't know if it's a PCI Express version mismatch, although it's running just fine on this board with PCI Express 4.0. But every time I tried to install drivers and get the card connected, it was just no dice. So I decided to call an audible and do some testing on my Erying 11900H motherboard, which again was one of the fastest single thread CPU performers that I have hands on right now. Now that's the second time I've mentioned single threaded performance, and there's a really good reason for that. It's most network transfers, network benchmarks, or file transfers are all single threaded dependent. And even more than that, they typically only run on a single thread. So that means CPUs like my 64 core Epic, which only run at 2.2 gigahertz natively, or my AMD 7601, are not exactly gonna cut the mustard when it comes to saturating a 100 gig link. The same even goes for my 7th gen i7 over here with the 7820X, as it's gonna fall woefully behind some modern processors. However, chips like the 5218 Cascade Lake or the 11900H here should be good enough to at least come close to saturating a 100 gig link. But of course, you won't know until you test it. So let's jump into some testing. Now, I ran through a multitude of different tests over the last week or so, trying to get as much bandwidth out of this system as I possibly could. Now, obviously, a single file transfer, a single network test is not going to saturate a 100 gig line. It's just not going to happen, even with some of the fastest CPUs that are out there. However, what I did find that running my 11900H with iPerf as the server and running four simultaneous instances of it gave me the best results from a couple of my other PCs. So that's exactly what we're gonna set up right now. So if you look at this command right here, I'm running four instances of iPerf, and all of them are going to be listening on different ports. Now, if we switch on over to my server, this is my TrueNAS server. We're going to run this command right here, which is running four simultaneous streams to those four iPerf3 servers. So let's see what happens. And right out of the gate, we're getting more than 20 gigabit per second per stream. Now, I will say there's a little bit of retry going on in here, which you typically want to avoid. But given that we are running in that test, we just transferred back and forth almost 200 gigabytes of data in 10 seconds. Upload and download. That's what we just did. So if we take a look at our results right here, uh, you can see the four uploads, sender, 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 and sender. Uh, we're doing 21.1, 21.1, 20.7, and 21.0. Similar on the receive end, 21, 21, 20.6, and 20.9. Uh, 
My math's a little fuzzy lately, but that's what, 82 gigabit per second? I will say off camera, I was able to get all the way up to 91.6 gigabit simultaneous transfer. I'm pretty happy. Let's go and run that again just for fun because it only takes 10 seconds. There we go. Pretty uh, similar results across the board there. What happens if we only run one stream? Are we going to be at 25 gigabit? Because I saw a number of comments on Twitter saying, well, a 100 gig connection is just four 25 gig connections. And you're kind of right, but you're also not. According to the Microtech CRS 504, this is just four bonded 25 gig interfaces. In fact, it shows up as four separate interfaces in the switch. But if we run a single stream from one client to another client, you can see I get an excess of, there's a 39, there's a 53.8 gigabit per second on a single stream. We just averaged 35.5 gigabit per second. We transferred 82.8 gigabytes in 10 seconds between one client to another client on a single threaded stream. So what are the real world implications and uses of 100 gig networking? Obviously my office notwithstanding as it's anything but real world in here sometimes. For big data, for large hypervisors, for cloud scale providers, 100, even 200 and 400 gig networking is used for storage area networks or interconnect between multiple clusters of servers. This means low latency, high bandwidth access for multiple simultaneous connections at once. Or for something like web servers where you're Google and you need to possibly serve a billion hosts at a time. That's definitely a use case for a pipe like this. However, in my office, we're typically only using one or two streams at a time where we might saturate a 10 gig line. But we're using increasingly higher bit rates on our camera seemingly as fast as I can blink my eye. Our current setup is using an Atomos Ninja 5 and we're recording in 422LT at 10 bit in 4K30. That's an insane amount of data and it equates to my average video project being in excess of about 600 gigabytes. One of the biggest challenges we face is in a six to eight hour workday, shooting a video, then uploading the footage and getting to work on it. Sometimes an upload can take well over an hour. Using a 100 gig connection, or in this case, even a 50 may or 50 gig upload, we could potentially cut that down to, I don't know, about 12 minutes. So go take a coffee break and then come back and your entire set of video footage is ready to edit. Not only that, but accessing that data from multiple different clients. There's often times that Rhett and I will be editing the same video or different sequences using the same raw footage where we'll both need to access that in real time. Before it's been a real challenge as my main editing rig is on 10 gig. However, my desk over here is only on one gig, especially if I need to upload footage without using that computer. That's a painfully slow process. Now I did do some file transfer testing with this 100 gig line and I ran into what should have been an expected bottleneck and that was the speed of my SSD NAS array. That's right, I have saturated the link of a RAID Z2 eight disc SSD array. I got about 1.8 gigabytes per second transfer speed which is roughly just under 20 gigabit per second. Still impressive, but definitely not exactly the end result that I'm going for. Later this week, I should have some NVMe drives arriving and we're gonna run four of those in a RAID Z1 to see if I can get a little bit more performance and we're gonna be installing that into my Cascade Lake server. So be sure to subscribe if you don't wanna miss the fireworks there. Now, obviously there's a ton of different situations and scenarios that I could test with 100 gig networking but I'm actually not sure what you guys want to see. If you guys have any suggestions of things you'd like to see on this network, let me know down in the comments below. Before we get to the end of this video, a huge shout out to Mikrotik for sending over the two CRS504s for my home network here. Links for where to find those are down in the video description. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Mastodon for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel, I wanna help support me and the crazy projects that I undertake on, that I undertake, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the usual place. 
that's going to do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Oh, yeah. This one's making it in the rotation from now on. Beer for today is from Ten Barrel Brewing over in Bend, Oregon. It is the Pub Beer Lager, and it's about as close to a domestic lager as I will ever spend my own money on. Yeah, if you read my, uh, my Twitter page, there is an announcement on there. It has to deal with the future of craft computing, at least for this video. And no, I won't even pour this in a glass. I'm going to drink straight from the can, which I think may be a first on this channel. <laughs> Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and it looks like Rhett is holding in a sneeze. There it is. I went, Welcome, and Rhett went, <gasps> Take your time. And of course, for the third day in a row, there's tree trimmers right across the street. Like, window, front yard, tree grinder. <laughs> Today we are making an ace cocktail. This is another cocktail that I have never had before. I don't know how we jumped from pub beer to an ace in the same video, but let's get this thing started. And I have a haircut. So first and foremost, we need literally just a splash of lemon juice. So I'm gonna take a lemon right there. Just... Next up, simply because I like making a lot of people squeamish, we're gonna do one egg white. Next up is one and a half ounces of a dry gin. Today we are going with the uh, Drum Shanbo. Drum Shanbo Slow Distilled Gunpowder Irish Gin. Uh, this is a 86 proof dry gin with oriental botanicals and gunpowder tea. We need a half ounce of grenadine. Now you can use the roses grenadine if you'd like. Uh, I make my own from pomegranate juice and it's just like making simple syrup. You do two to one sugar to pomegranate juice. And finally, to really uh, gross some people out, we're gonna add one half ounce of heavy whipping cream. Put that off and give it a shake. Now, any cocktail with an egg in it, you want to shake very vigorously. And in fact, you can also dry shake your cocktail beforehand and then add ice to it and then shake again. Um, I'm just gonna shake once and you serve it up in a Nick and Nora glass. Last but not least, a little bit of garnish, a little bit of nutmeg on top. And there you have the ace. Cheers, everyone. Oh, you're not gonna want one of those. You know, when I read about this cocktail, I knew it was gonna be like a really good dessert cocktail, but I couldn't put my finger on what it was going to taste like because just look at the raw ingredients list. Normally you're able to nail the general profile in your mind before you go and make a cocktail. An old fashioned, a Manhattan, uh, whatever else, you know what whiskey tastes like, you know what vermouth tastes like, you probably know what they taste like together, right? This has gin, egg white, heavy whipping cream, grenadine, lemon, and nutmeg. And what I will say is the flavor profile is definitely all those blended up very nicely, incredibly well balanced into a cocktail that is not only a fantastic dessert cocktail, but one that I would drink pretty much all spring, summer, and especially fall and winter long. Rhett's eyes are rolling back in his head too. My toes are curling. <laughs> uh, need a cigarette? I might. <laughs>